All right. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is uh, today's installment of Talking Democracy, brought to you by Democracy, a Journal of Ideas. I'm Michael Tomaski. I'm the editor of the journal, and I am delighted, really delighted to be joined today by Sanford Levinson, distinguished professor of law and of government, right, Sandy, and of government yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at uh, the University of Texas. And, and Sandy just led an effort in that resulted in uh, that we published in the uh, summer issue of Democracy Journal, in which we assembled um, a handful of, no more than a handful, a, a number of distinguished legal liberal scholars, uh, not just to critique the existing constitution or talk about the constitution or talk about constitutional theory, but to write a new constitution for the United States. And it's, you can find it at democracyjournal.org. Uh, I think it's very uh, interesting and exciting and invigorating and it has a lot of ideas that I know I would love to see and I know Sandy would too. Sandy, hello and welcome and thanks for joining me. Delighted to be here. Uh, the genesis of this was, I guess, within my brain some years ago when I thought this would be a good idea uh, to do. And um, it took me a while to finally act on it. But I called you sometime in 2019. Uh, and you said, that's a great idea. I'd love to uh, take the reins here. So why don't you tell folks uh, who are tuned in here uh, what you did from there? Yeah, well. <clears throat> What I did is very easy to describe in a way. I put together a wish list. Uh, by and large, I will admit of people I knew, and then some recommendations that they had of people I didn't. But the criteria, frankly, were to be identified somewhere on the progressive left liberal left or whatever. Um, and especially the people I knew that they worked well with others. <laughs> um, and the idea was to get 55 people, which was the number of at least official delegates in Philadelphia. And I'm not sure what number we had at the maximum, it was around 55. But as was the case in Philadelphia, right. a number of people dropped out, largely because of the pandemic um, and other responsibilities. But we ended up with, I would say, somewhere between 30 and 40 people who participated in one way or another, and about 25 people who participated very actively. Um, and I will say for all of the costs of the pandemic to the project, one of the great advantages was the ability to go on Zoom quite regularly from right after Thanksgiving last year to the last day of March this year and to have very intense discussions that quite frankly, I don't think we would have been able to have absent the pandemic because we just yeah. had not discovered the possibilities of Zoom. Yeah, and uh, tell folks who some of the people were. There were some very well-known people there and, and, and some people you know, quite distinguished in your field. Sure, um, probably the best known to many of the people would be Linda Greenhouse, who won a Pulitzer Prize for coverage of the Supreme Court and has been teaching at Yale for a number of years. Um, she accepted and not surprisingly focused on the section of the new constitution dealing with judiciary. Uh, I will also mention her husband, Eugene Fidel, who is one of the country's ranking experts in military law, but also teaches a Native American law. And he, together with Sarah Krakoff and Stacey Leeds, put together what is 
almost undoubtedly the most audacious aspect of the new constitution, which really recognizes the reality of roughly 575 indigenous nations in a way that's literally unprecedented. Um, there were um, Tom Ginsburg, who knows as much about comparative constitutions as anybody in the world, was a very active participant. And in a way, this is very Madisonian, because what Madison did was to have Jefferson ship him a box full of books about constitutions from ancient Greece to the present, that is 1787. And a major aspect of our discussions was comparative, sometimes comparative with other countries. Um, and there, somebody like um, Tom or Mark Tushnet from Harvard um, or Rosalind Dixon, who actually teaches in Australia. Uh, yeah. David Landau, who teaches in Florida, were very helpful. But one of my own very, very strong interests is American state constitutions and the importance of realizing that state constitutions are very different in very interesting ways from the US Constitution. Um, but it, it would take too much time, I think, to go through you know, even a dozen of the people and really lay out their biographies. I will say that it's very important, oh, two, two more, that one of the members of our drafting committee who really did the work much more than I did of translating the discussions into the prose that is in the issue. One of the members of the drafting committee was Bo Breslin, a political scientist at Skidmore. And it is very, very important that not everybody was a lawyer. Yeah. Um, another person who was extremely valuable in the discussions, particularly of social and economic rights, was Steve Jacobs from Austin, Texas, who uh, has worked ever since I've known him, since he came to Austin, with the Industrial Areas Foundation, with Ernie Cortez. And starting about a dozen years ago, he founded an organization dealing with job training yeah. um, for, for locals in Austin. And so he has a lot to say about what the Constitution might say about social and economic rights. Yeah, that was really interesting. And, and I certainly learned a lot following your deliberations about the South African Constitution, which I had not known. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so now let's, uh, let's so 10 minutes in, nine minutes in, let's, let's start cutting to the chase uh, and, and tell people what's in here and, and quickly why. And let's ru run through these at a, at a reasonably brisk clip. Uh, I'm sure one thing that everybody watching us now is interested in is the Senate. What did you do with the Senate? Well, I'm very fond of quoting Republican Senator George Voinovich, who in his 2010 exit interview with the Washington Post said that he'd been gonna become disgusted with the Senate. And here I'm quoting him, we needed to blow up the Senate. I do not mean that literally, obviously, right. <laughs> but I think that one of the things that unites everybody who views themselves as progressive is that something drastic has to be done with the United States Senate. There was vigorous discussion about what, and our collective conclusion was to what I call defame the Senate. That is to strip the Senate of most of its practical power today to veto legislation. They become much more like the English House of Lords having a so-called suspensive veto, but ultimately in contests between the House and the Senate, the House will always win. And that's yeah. very, very important. Yeah. And then you changed two per state as well. Pardon? You changed two senators per state as yes. well. Yes. Uh, each state gets one senator 
and then states get additional senators for 5 million people with a cap on six senators. So that means that California still doesn't have what one might view as its fair number of senators. But frankly, in a defanged Senate, it's not so important right. as it is in the reality we live in, where notoriously Wyoming, with 170th of the population of California, has an equal voting power. Right, right. Wow. Just imagine what that would be like. <laughs> yeah. uh, let, let's move to the Electoral College. What, what did we do there? Again, of a president. I, I think for anybody defined as progressive, and for that matter, most people in the country, this is not really a hard-edged ideological issue, except for some of the right-wing Republicans. Um, the Electoral College is low-hanging fruit. So we get rid of the Electoral College. We have a popular elected president. And maybe apropos, given that today is mayor election day in New York, we require ranked choice voting. Mm -hmm. um, and But no more Electoral College, no more having to figure out how to gain the Electoral College system. Yeah. And with respect to elections of House members, uh, you uh, uh, counsel multi-member districts. Explain to people why that's better. Right. Here too, there was vigorous discussion. Mm -hmm. Some of us, and us would include me in, in this context, would require multi-member districts for any states with more say than five or six representatives. Mm -hmm and proportional representation. So the importance of multi-member districts and proportional representation is first of all, it doesn't get rid of gerrymandering entirely, but it minimizes the importance of gerrymandering. Secondly, proportional representation, which is a system used throughout the world, will break the two-party duopoly. And I think that there is not unanimous agreement, but general agreement that a country of 320 million people could use more than two dominant parties. Again, if you look around the world, we are certainly the exception in concentrating on a two-party system. Now, there was vigorous discussion so what ended up is that states can choose between retaining single member districts or have multi-member districts. Um, and you know, there's no coercion there as to what the choice is. Yeah, uh, it's 2.15, we're halfway through. Although if we go a little long, you can go a little long maybe? I'm here for all afternoon. Terrific, <laughs> wonderful. And uh, uh, people can start, uh, I see we have a nice number of attendees. If people have questions, you can submit them and I'll try to get to them before we finish up here. Um, you, you referenced uh, a few minutes ago, uh, the third legislative branch, the Council of Indigenous Nations, which I yep. thought was certainly the most uh, inventive and interesting uh, of all the changes uh, that you proposed. So uh, talk about how that came about and what it would do. Well, it came about, frankly, because of the participation of Stacey Leeds, Jean Fidel, and Sarah Krakoff. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's fair to say that within the academy and even more in the world at large, not much attention is paid to the reality of indigenous nations, to the legal reality or alas, even the social reality. Um, they brought that home. And literally from the very beginning, there has been this real tension between the notion of the sovereign United States and all of the sovereign nations that were here before the first English or Spanish settler mm -hmm. set foot in what we now call the United States. And so they made the argument that Indi indigenous nations 
ought to be viewed the way we tend to view, quote, sovereign states, which are, of course, a very, very important part of the legal reality of the United States. Um, again, you know, there was a very interesting discussion. Uh, there was not unanimous agreement, um, but there was, I think, collective agreement that insofar as one of our functions is, we hope, to jumpstart a long, long overdue discussion on what a constitution adequate to the 21st century might look like, yeah. then this really ought to be discussed because it captures a very important reality that most of us, including myself, have chosen to be by and large ignorant of. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what you just said leads me to a question that I possibly could have asked at the outset, but I'll ask it now anyway. Uh, and it, it concerns sort of the overriding theory of, of this exercise uh, and of the constitution that you wrote. Now, I'm obviously not the scholar you are, but I've read my Madison. I've read, you know, many books on it. And, you know, the founders, the, the delegates to the original constitution convention in 1787 seem to be driven by or produce a document that was driven by a distrust of democracy, certainly of direct, direct democracy. And, and uh, you know, a, a sense that uh, government needed various choke points uh, and needed to move slowly uh, so that um, so that it was so that it was deliberative, so that all decisions were quite deliberative. Uh, what were your motivating or animating uh, principles? I say two different things. First of all, I think it's fair to say that all of us without exception, are more little d democratic than almost anybody in Philadelphia. Um, and one of the things, one of the ways it's reflected is that a number of us were attracted to various at proposals for more direct democracy. I would include myself in that group. Yeah. But I will also say that most of the group was not so attracted by direct democracy as some others of us. And so the text kind of reflects some of the mixed feelings. The second motivation, if you ask me my motivation, one thing I do share with the 1787 framers is the belief that structures are probably more important than declarations of rights in terms of the actualities of what we get. So, you know, if we look today at what is being bottled up in the U.S. Senate, it is not because we, the people, have made a decision that we don't want any electoral form or we don't want any infrastructure spending or we don't want any gun control measures, et cetera. It is because the U.S. Senate <laughs> is able to stop it. Yeah. And so my motivation is to generate a discussion, which I think just isn't taking place nationally, about the adequacy of our structures. Other people in the group, though they didn't reject the importance of structures, mm -hmm. also believe very, very strongly that we ought to t think about what rights we want in the 21st century so that in fact, article one of our draft is a set of rights, including socioeconomic rights, a wealth tax, for example, mm -hmm. um, that a majority voted for. I mentioned Steve Jacobs before, he was an important uh, force behind that. I voted for it, but my own energies were much more focused on the structural problems that I think afflict us than any of the deficiencies that you know I might feel with regards to rights provisions. Yeah, uh, and let me ask you one uh, one semi tough question along those lines. There's a wealth tax, and there's a guaranteed minimum income that it that is 
you know, some would say rather high, one quarter of a member of Congress's salary. Yep. Why are these constitutional concerns? Well, it's a very, very good question. Um, and we probably don't have enough time to go fully into yeah. it. Let me say that there are two different notions of what constitutions do. One of them is to lay out hard and fast legal rights that will be enforced by courts. So that if Congress doesn't pass certain legislation, that a court will say, you got to do this. This has come up incidentally, very interestingly and importantly in countries like South Africa and, and Chile and in Colombia and others. Another notion of constitutions though, is that they set out what are viewed as aspirations. Think of the preamble. For better, and I would say for worse, one of the first things that lawyers learn is that the preamble isn't something that a sophisticated lawyer will ever refer to in a brief or in an argument to tell a judge, your honor, my client should win because it would establish justice yeah. is not a good legal argument. But I love the preamble to the constitution because it tells us what the point of the enterprise is. So a number of other constitutions around the world, uh, Ireland and India are the most notable examples, have what they call aspirational sections in which they say, look, the point of this constitution is to achieve justice. We don't think this is best done through litigation and court order, but everybody who takes an oath of office as a representative as a president should know that part of that oath is to work for achieving justice and achieving justice includes social justice and providing some sort of safety net. Yeah. And even if courts have no role to play and generally speaking, though there's vig was vigorous debate among us, generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that most of our group, and I think this is true of much of the progressive left these days, has pretty much lost the Warren court faith or infatuation with, with the judiciary. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that that's pretty beyond dispute at this point. <laughs> um, now, uh, what has the reaction been like from your colleagues uh, across the profession and, and otherwise? Well, let me say, you know, if ever there's a time to quote Zhou and Lai in response to, you know, the famous question, was the French Revolution a success? And he says, it's too early to tell. Right. It, it's way too early to tell. I think that both of us share the hope that it will become a topic of vigorous discussion, not only among academics, but much, much more importantly, among the populace at large. So you know, it's only two weeks since the text was made available. I've gotten some feedback from friends and colleagues um, who have commented on the audaciousness of some of the proposals and you know, generally say, well, you know, isn't this really an academic enterprise where academic is used in a fairly pejorative sense? Yes. Um, and my hope is that it's not an academic enterprise in that sense. It is academic in that most of our group consisted of academics and it reflects for better and for worse the way academics tend to think. But it is intended, as I say, to be part of a public discussion. So, so far the only kind of published review, so to speak, that I've seen was by Damon Linker right. in the journal The Week, 
I think it's fair to describe Linker as moderately right of center. And he gave a respectful review and I was quite happy with it. I mean, my view, it's not quite that no publicity is bad publicity. I think there right. can be such a thing. If people accuse us of simply being stupid, that would perturb me. But I will be almost as happy with a serious essay saying, well, there's some good parts, but I think this goes too far, et cetera, as one that says, this is wonderful. Congress should adopt it and send it on immediately for ratification. I don't think the latter is likely to occur, to yeah, put it mildly. Yep, yeah, no, <laughs> alas. Uh, we have a number of questions and most of them are kind of along these lines. For example, Christopher P asking, how does this become more than just an academic exercise? And, and others asking, you know, how we get this in front of a larger audience, how we get this to be a, a topic of national conversation. I can answer that as well as Sandy for my part quickly. I mean, I, you know, Democracy Journal is a small circulation journal that reaches a kind of a, an elite audience, including those of you who are turned, tuned in here today and not a broad audience, but but we're doing our part to try to, to jumpstart this conversation and, and, and to make people realize that we have to talk about these constitutional structures, which is a conversation that the broad left hasn't want to, wanted to have very much of. They've, they've had it much more sandy on the right than on the left in, in the past decade. So you know, talk about that and, and how that process might, might build on, on our well, political side. I mean, there's a real paradox that the right wing is identified these days with originalism, veneration for the founders, savage critique of the Supreme Court should it stray from what they believe was the original constitution. But it's also the right wing that has been willing to say, you know, there are problems in the constitution and maybe we need to amend them. So the best known example, I mean, putting demagoguery like flag burning amendments and the like to one side, the best known example is certainly the push for a balanced budget amendment. 1787 constitution said nothing about the national budget. Right. There's nothing, you know, framers are irrelevant, but they've been pushing for a balanced budget amendment now for 30 years. Um, I think it's a very bad idea. But my regret is that the response of the left by and large was to say, how dare you think of amending the constitution? So that Kathleen Sullivan, who was then, I think, Dean of the Stanford Law School, wrote a famous article sometime in the 1990s attacking basically the very idea of amending the constitution um, and by and large, that has been the response of the left. So that when the right proposed, say, a flag burning amendment, another terrible, terrible idea, the response wasn't simply to say it's a terrible idea. Rather, it was to say, we've got this perfect bill of rights. Let's not even think of how it might be modified. Um, and so that this has interesting implications, say, for the Second Amendment. Very few people on the left are big fans of the Second Amendment, but the Second Amendment is part of the Bill of Rights just as much as the First Amendment is. And so um, I think one last illustration, the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, who is way to the right, in 2017, published a 90-page essay written in part by a very talented graduate of the Harvard Law School on the need for constitutional amendment and, in fact, a new constitutional convention. He, and he put forth the Texas plan, which had a number of suggested changes. Almost all of them I disagreed with. But again, the response was to say that this was just another sign 
of Abbott's lunacy that he wanted a constitutional convention or would yeah. talk about serious constitutional reform rather than to say, you know, let's give one cheer for this right-wing governor because he's willing to say that we should actually think about constitutional structures. And then what the left should do is to say, okay, you've started this discussion. Here are our own ideas. So, you know, that I think is one of the huge, huge problems facing the left. And for that matter, left pundits and commentators. So that I've often picked on Tom Friedman, somebody I respect a great deal, clearly extraordinary able. He has written stunning columns criticizing contemporary American politics, but never once has he been willing to connect the dots yeah. between our malignant politics and political structures that give Mitch McConnell <laughs> power he never would have in a sanely designed constitution for the 21st century. Uh, speaking of Mitch McConnell, so we've run over and we're going to run just a little bit more over. We haven't lost any attendees to speak of, so uh, I assume people are interested in hearing you talk. So let's let you talk a little bit more. Uh, here we are on this day, June 22nd, when the Senate is taking up the voting rights bills. Um, Mitch McConnell is going to block them and they're going to fail and we'll see what happens from there. Um, I'm interested in partially in your thoughts on that, but really more to the point, where, are, where does our democracy stand right now in your view? Well, I'm chicken little, basically. Mm. Um, I wrote a book last year with my friend Jack Balkan at the Yale Law School who is quite optimistic that this is a phase we're going through, but we'll come out the other side in pretty good shape. Um, I'm much less optimistic than Jack is. I think that it is extraordinarily important that most of the American public for the last 10 or 15 years have had almost no real faith in Congress. You know, so just standard polling, do you approve, disapprove? On a very good day, Congress will get 20% approval. And most often it's at 10 to 15%. That's not merely partisan. If you look at presidential approval, you can say most of that is partisan. Um, with Congress, it's not merely partisan. With direction of the country and the fact that most of the country believes we're moving in the wrong direction, that's not merely partisan. So I think that there is a tremendous frustration that government isn't doing what people think is necessary. I put it that way, because I think wherever you are on the political spectrum, you do not have faith that Congress will respond adequately to what you think is the most important problem. For people like us, we will talk about a whole variety of progressive positions and how, you know, one kind of abandons all hope when you look at the current Senate. But assume you're on the right wing and you think that we need to get control of entitlement spending, that we need to have a different and at least coherent immigration policy and the like. You also don't have any faith in Congress. And I think that's a very, very serious problem. The one national institution these days that people really respect is the military. 
And that's good news, bad news. Even the judiciary, which historically was the most respected of the national institutions, now on a good day will be at about 55% and very often will be in the 40s. Um, I don't see how one can be optimistic with this sort of data that's now been true, as I say, for about 20 years. So with Democratic or Republican presidents, the ultimate message at the end of their terms is that these were failed or semi-failed presidencies. Uh, Barack Obama got the Affordable Care Act through, but the rest of his program basically died. And we're gonna find out in the next six weeks whether Joe Biden is a failed president and or whether he's going to have to push, push, push executive power yeah. for all it's worth, which is not good news. Right. Six weeks, eh? So well, we're, I mean, we're on you notice. know Washington better than I, mm -hmm. but at what point will you throw up your hands and say that it really is hopeless unless a miracle happens in the 2022 elections. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot to talk about there, but uh, we'll leave it for next time. Um, the project is the Democracy Constitution. You can see it at www.democracyjournal.org. Hope you'll read it, hope you'll tweet it, hope you'll tell people about it, hope you'll write about it, good or bad, if that's what you do. Uh, hope you'll help spread the word. Um, and my great thanks to all of you who watched. Uh, really appreciate you tuning in. Please check out Democracy Journal now and in the future. Uh, uh, we're not always doing stuff quite as unique as this, but I think we're always doing something kind of interesting. And most of all, my great thanks to Sanford Levinson of the University of Texas. Sandy, thanks so much. Well, I mean, the, the thanks are mine. I, I refer to this as the Tomaski project because without Michael, it would have remained an academic fantasy in the most pejorative sense <laughs> of academic. And he made it possible. And I come back to the fact that there were 30 to 40 really energized people who debated one another, disagreed with one another. And then there were the five people on our committee of detail who put it into a readable form and they really deserve the credit. They did a great job. Uh, Sandy, thanks again. And folks, everyone, thanks for watching. Uh, I bid you good afternoon. <laughs>